Good morning, everyone. We welcome you at this upcoming panel discussion about the Kurdish region in Iran, uh, their challenges, existence, and goals. Uh, my name is Yusuf Ismail. This, uh, I work at the Washington Kurdish Institute, and I would like to remind everyone that this event is co-sponsored and co-hosted by the Washington Kurdish Institute, the WKI, and also the program on human rights and peace building at uh, Columbia University's Institute for, human, uh, for Study of Human Rights. Uh, I'm honored and privileged to announce that our keynote speaker is Professor David Phillips, the director of the program of human rights and peace building at Columbia University. Uh, Professor Phillips uh, has worked as a senior foreign policy advisor uh, for several administrations, including during President Clinton, President Bush, and President Obama. Uh, he has spent decades advocating for human rights across the globe, but also focusing on the Kurdish issue in all far, four parts of Kurdistan. We welcome him, and he's going to uh, co-chair this meeting as well, and we look forward to hearing from him and his remarks. We also have with us uh, Mr. Arash Saleh, the representative of the Democratic Party of Iranian Kurdistan, KDPI. We have with us Mr. Salah Bayzidi, the representative of Komala Party to the United States, and Mr. Kamaran Balnur, the representative of Kurdistan Democratic Party, uh, Iran to the United States. We welcome you all. We will have very brief um, remarks by our guests since we would like to make this session more engaging by you so if you have a question, please raise your hand on the screen. I will enable your mic to ask your question directly to our guests. And otherwise you can also uh, submit your question during the, on the session, on the section of uh, Q&A on your screen. Uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Phillips will start the session. Thank you. David, if you don't mind to unmute, Yusuf, thank, so thank you very much for convening the panel this morning. And thanks to the Washington Kurdish Institute for its excellent work raising awareness about Kurdish issues uh, in the United States and around the world. It's a pleasure to be a part of the panel with my friends Arash, Salah, and Kamran. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining the discussion today. It's a privilege for me to participate and to share some thoughts with you. Iranian Kurdistan, also known as East Kurdistan or Rojalat, is home to 12 million Kurds who are dispersed in parts of Kermanshah, Ilam, West Azerbaijan, and Kurdistan provinces. The history of Kurds in Iran is a history of violence and abuse and of misrepresentations uh, by the regime since the revolution in 1979. In return for supporting the revolution, Iranian Kurds were promised local self-government and control over natural resources and economic decision-making. They were also promised cultural rights, including use of both Farsi and Kurdish languages in education. However, the Iranian Kurds were deceived uh, by Ruhollah Khomeini. Uh, they were barred from participating in Khomeini's assembly of experts. Kurds protested, uh, chanting no referendum, self-determination first. Iran's new constitution embraced the principle of Islamic jurisprudence and Shia supremacy, while ignoring demands of Kurds and other minorities for regional autonomy. Article 15 of Iran's constitution established Persian, as the Islamic Republic's official language. The Constitution uh, promised uniform economic and social development and cultural rights to all Iranian citizens. However, Kurdish areas were denied investment and lagged behind. Uh, Kurds refused to participate uh, in a referendum to approve the Constitution in March of 1979. Uh, when they took up arms to defend their basic rights, 
200,000 members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps launched a brutal counterinsurgency campaign. Uh, those threats by Iranian security forces uh, continue to this day. And I understand that within the past 24 hours, those threats have been renewed against Iranian Kurdistan. Uh, the Kurdish, Kurdistan Democratic Party of Iran, KDPI, proposed a five-point peace plan in 1979, which was rejected by Khomeini's representatives, who insisted that they disarm before negotiations. Khomeini declared a holy war against the Kurds on August 19th of 1979. He fully rejected the concept of minority rights during a speech in December of that year. And disparaging Kurds, he referred to them as the children of Satan and enemies of God. By 1982, more than 10,000 Kurds had been killed and 200,000 displaced by the IRGC. Thousands more were convicted in show trials and executed. Social injustice still prevails in Iranian Kurdistan, which is one of the poorest regions in Iran, measured in terms of average income, literacy rates, and life expectancy. Unemployment of Iranian Kurds is about 50%. Kurds have rejected state-sponsored education in, in Farsi. Uh, the demands of Iranian Kurds were inspired by regional developments, including the rise of the PKK, rebellion in Turkey, and Iraq's constitution of 2004, which provided extensive rights to Kurds living in Iraq. Kurds in Iran aspire to the same rights as their Kurdish brethren in Iraq. Non-Persian ethnic groups, including Kurds, Arabs, Azeris, Baluchis, uh, comprise about 40 to 50 percent of Iran's population and represent a potent political force. However, divisions between Kurdish factions and between the Kurds and other ethnic minorities have undermined their effectiveness. Uh, the Kamala Party of Iranian Kurdistan evolved into the KDP, which splintered in 1988. Despite personality conflicts and power struggles, uh, these groups share the same goal, a democratic federal republic in Iran with local control over politics, natural resources, economic development, and cultural expression. Today's panel will discuss challenges, existence, and goals of Iranian Kurds. During the discussion, we will consider relations between uh, various Kurdish factions and parties. We'll also explore opportunities for cooperation between Iranian Kurds and other minorities in Iran, as well as strategies for political transition in Iran which is the overall objective that the panel shares and which I share with each of you. Columbia University's program on peace building and human rights is pleased to co-sponsor this panel with the Washington Kurdish Institute. I've gotten to know the panelists over the past year. We've had previous meetings uh, in, uh, at Columbia on January 27th of 2020 and in Washington on March 4. We made plans to broaden the circle and upgrade the level of participation. However, these plans were postponed as a result of the coronavirus, which has restricted travel. Uh, we hope to resume our work plan as soon as health conditions permit. Meanwhile, the Zoom technology allows us to interact and to further explore ideas and modalities for cooperation. Our plan is to uh, bring the US-based representatives who are on the panel uh, to a broader discussion in Europe in order to break the ice, 
finalize terms of reference for a dialogue project, and agree on the way forward. As a next step after that, we plan to organize a larger conference of Iranian Kurds, including civil society representatives, scholars, and very significantly women's groups in order to discuss federalism and constitutional power sharing arrangements. Once there is consensus among Iranian Kurds, we will reach out to other ethnic minorities in Iran in order to deepen our contact, communication, and cooperation. Colombia hopes that confidence building will lay the ground for a coalition focused on enhanced local self-government and political transition. We're grateful to WKI for stewarding this dialogue process and for organizing today's meeting. We hope that the benefits of freedom and prosperity will inspire Iranians to work more closely together and cooperate with one another and with the United States and other interested Western countries so that Iran can shed its status as a pariah and realize the potential of its rich history and culture. Gentlemen, honored to be with you today. I look forward to hearing your remarks, having a discussion, and engaging with WKI's audience. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Professor Phillips. Uh, Mr. Saleh, Mr. Arash. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, uh, David. Thank you very much, WKI, for holding this event. Uh, so basically, uh, the Rojhalat of Kurdistan, AKA Iranian Kurdistan, AKA Kurdistan of Iran, is the most forgotten part. Uh, but not to forget that the Kurdish nationalism was originated in Rojalat. Uh, in pre-modern era, the longest and the most robust Kurdish dynasty, Erdalans, was centered in Sanandaj in Rojalat from where they organized their territory for several centuries, a territory that based on Sharif Khan Badlisi, the most renowned Kurdish historian, sometimes also encompassed Karadagh, Kirku, Kafri, Khanakin, and Sharazur in Southern Kurdistan. In the modern times, the first experience of Kurdish self-rule was established in Mahabad in Rojhalat in the form of an independent republic. Rojhalat is also the home for the oldest Kurdish political organization. The most, in, uh, the most important inst uh, institutes of Kurdish nationalism, including Peshmerga, National Anthem, and uh, Kurdish Banner are all products of rich political culture in Rojalat. But Rojalat is forgotten not because it is silent. We don't hear from Rojalat not because nothing's going on there. Quite contrary, Rojalat is, uh, uh, is more alive than any time. It has its own way of expressing itself under the, under the most brutal and the most insidious dictatorship mankind has seen in the past half a century. But unfortunately, uh, when it comes to Iran, other topics and subjects such as JCPOA, maximum pressure, the relationship between the United States and Iran, they are all topics and subjects that in, uh, more interest you know, the mass media. And when it comes to Kurds, other parts of Kurdistan are hotter spots and therefore more exciting for those who want to work in Kurds. Uh, in Rojhalat, there are both social and political struggles. The social struggle is represented by various movements inside and outside of the country, of which uh, student movement, women movement, and uh, an inquiet and fragile civil society, which is mainly based abroad, are parts. The political struggle, however, that uh, shapes the context of life and activity in Rojalat is represented by political parties. There are various political parties, but uh, the main four have formed an umbrella organization called the Cooperation Center. That is one of the reasons that Kurdish opposition is different from the rest of Iranian opposition. We are constantly, uh, let's say, working with each other to mend our fences, to bridge gaps between us and make it easier to cooperate and work as a body. Also, uh, we are better organized and have, uh, and you know, I haven't seen any 
uh, opposition groups with the same level of organization. Uh, but the most important difference is that we believe no other Iranian opposition group enjoyed the same amount of constituency and support from within the society as the Kurdish political parties do. Uh, the proof is, in various occasions, we have been able to organize public strikes in which, like in all four provinces, Kurdish provinces of Iran, as much as 16 cities and towns participated, and that is uh, obviously minus small towns and villages. The other reason for this uh, belief of us is, as we speak, the PDKI Peshmerga forces are inside Iranian Kurdistan and the people there are harboring them and helping them. And that is why they are able to stay deep inside the borders for long periods and do their activities and carry out their missions without regime noticing them. Uh, for the past four years, uh, since the PDKI resumed its armed struggle, Peshmerga forces have been constantly deep inside the Iranian borders. And it is not possible unless the majority of people uh, in towns and villages consider th these Peshmerga as a force of themselves and for themselves. Uh, regime and terrorists of IRGC know this reality very well. And since they're not able to do anything inside Rojalat and they're unable to confront us inside Rojalat, they start blind shelling up Kurdish villages on the borders of Iranian Kurdistan and KRG. While our Peshmerga forces are deep inside the soil of Iranian Kurdistan and we have never, never initiated any attacks on Iranians or IRGC from anywhere outside of Iran's borders. In the, lands, uh, in the last instance, on the June 16th and 17th, IRGC opened heavy artillery fire on livestock and farms of the villagers in er some areas like Alane, Choman, Haji Omaran, and Sida Khan. Uh, well, it is good to know that uh, you know, our Peshmerga forces sustained no casualties, but they used Katyusha rockets and long range artillery to basically hit people, defenseless people there to hit like livestock and farm, farmers there. Uh, also, I was just reading a report uh, on IRGC announcing they have deployed significant amount of forces uh, to the borders with Iraq and probably, probably some have crossed the borders somewhere near like, let's say, Hanakin. Pakpur, the IRGC commander said that their target is the Rojhalati parties. But as we saw in the case of missile attacks on our basis, the silence of world and especially the lack of a, a considerable response from United States will encourage them to step up their operations and try to further stretch their muscles in the region. You know, uh, if the world had shown a strong response to Iran using ballistic missiles to attack the camps of uh, dissidents deep inside the Iraqi soil uh, a few years ago, they wouldn't have the courage to attack Saudi oil facility a little bit uh, after one year later. Uh, the Iranian regime also has never stopped violence and assassinations of leaders and activists as its response to the questions at hand. Uh, they actually use violence, assassination and killing and torture as a response to all the questions they are facing. Their infamous act of using diplomatic cover for their terrorists is well known for the international society. And it is an indicative of how this regime cannot be trusted at all. Uh, it is a shame also uh, that European states usually turn a blind eye when Iranians use their soil uh, for such terrorist attacks. As an instance, uh, in the case of Dr. Qasem Lou, the Austrian government shamelessly let assassins who were in the custody of their police to go and leave the country and went back to Iran. Uh, just last week, an active member of PDKI who was a former member of our leadership survived an assassination attempt in Netherlands. Sadek Zarza was stabbed several times by Iranian who allegedly uh, went uh, to Netherlands like a few months ago uh, on a student visa. Uh, we basically are waiting the investigations by Dutch police. 
uh, but considering the records of Islamic Republic, it is not hard to drive conclusions now. And uh, actually, I want to mention that his family also blamed uh, uh, Iranians for this uh, assassination attempt. Let's uh, go back to the political struggle that we were talking about. Uh, the quest of this struggle is a democratic and federal Iran in which the rights of Kurdish people are preserved in, uh, in a self-governance. In this federal system, we demand the Kurdish people have their parliament, their local government, and also participate in the federal government through federal bodies. We believe that uh, the political checks and balances that this form of governance actually provide will make Iran a democracy that is pro-West, pro-United States, and pro-Israel. I believe that the expansionism and revolutionary behavior that Iran conducts outside its borders will not simply go away by replacing the, cur the current strata of rulers in Tehran by another one as long as the root cause is not addressed properly. Well, I believe this root cause is the same sociopolitical underpinnings that regenerate Persian supremacism inside its borders, and it only can be checked through a federal system in which Kurds play their role. So uh, it is easy to say that our cause to reach our rights in, inside a democratic and federal Iran is actually a cause to reach a sustainable peace in the, uh, in the region and to make Iran amenable to Western values of democracy and to turn it into a reliable neighbor in the region and a good friend of Israel. Look at the records of the Kurds in other parts of Kurdistan. Look how their participation in uh, you know, political process has helped uh, democracy to thrive. Look how Kurds are pro-Western values of democracy. Uh, we believe that the experience of United States to support communities to establish some sort of self-governance will make the Middle East a better Middle East, a peaceful Middle East. The communities in Middle East are more prone to democracy, are more prone to a rational behavior than an ideological behavior. Uh, and uh, my witness is Kurds in Iraq and Kurds in Syria. We believe that such an, such an experience can be repeated in uh, Iran also. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Arash. Uh, that was a very powerful remarks. We appreciate it. And there will be a lot of questions about your remarks as well. Uh, Mr. Baizidi, please, unmute yourself, please. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for Washington Kurdish Institute for organizing this event. And thank you for Dr. Phillips for great uh, remark about the Iranian Kurds. Uh, I'm trying in my talking, which is, is briefly, I reduced the uh, the historical Kurdish struggle in Iran, I'm trying to focus on some main points here. But uh, I, I have to go back to some small historical memory we have. 41 years ago, when the revolution took place in Iran, Iranian Kurds, alongside other ethnic groups in Iran, participated for hope for free democratic Iran. Uh, in, in reality, in Iranian Kurdistan, never Islamic revolution happened to place. As a first stage, as remind the audience, on April 4, 1979, when Khomeini proposed the uh, Islamic Republic referendum for yes or no, the Kurds fully boycotted. So from that point, the revolution in Kurdistan diverged to, uh, you know, different from what was going on in the rest of Iran. Uh, the Khomeini was anger the Kurds. Uh, the Kurds still remained peaceful, trying to resolve the issue with the central government. I just can point to, beside the boycotting, which is very civil, they, in one point in, in July, prior to Khomeini's uh, declared jihad against the Kurds, uh, the city of Marijuana, you know, entire the city, left the city peacefully when they, the regimes, you know, institutions trying to be established in that city. So the Kurds tried to all their best to, to, to avoid any 
confrontation, any military confrontation, but eventually the Khomeini did not uh, tolerate what was in Kurdistan, you know, while in the rest of Iran, they tried to, uh, to take away women's right to how to dress, uh, it, Kurdistan become, uh, you know, place for rest of, you know, freedom lovers in Iran, they went to Kurdistan. And eventually, as, as Dr. Cliffs talked, in July 1979, Khomeini declared uh, fatwa, jihad against the Kurds. It took more than decades uh, in military could be defeated, but politically still is strong. It took, uh, by estimate, between 60 to 80,000 lives during what, that decade. Kurdistan still remained um, militarized. Uh, when some changes might happen in other parts of Iran, we still have a political execution in Iran. Uh, the Kurdistan has uh, over 60 people on death row. Uh, so the, the Kurdish situation is not uh, changed much, but what happened to change for, for the Kurdistan and rest of Iran, I think it was in, in November 2019, when the, the protest took place in Iran, for first time we saw the widespread protest, which is the uh, same thing what the Kurds were asking for for decades, you know. We, the people who are this time took on the street they were not middle class like uh, in, in 2009, you know, they were upset about the result of the presidential election. The people, the so-called poor people and low class people who the regime always, you know, saw them as uh, their basis, these people. So, and, but what we saw, uh, the regime in the two days, what the, took a policy shot to kill pe people policy. So over... Uh, less than a week, you know, 1,500 people by estimate being killed, 12,000 uh, 12, being detained. And it was, we at that time, uh, as the Kurds, you know, alongside other groups, we, we, we predicted, you know, big change in Iran. Because as immediately after that, that protest, you know, we saw how the regime in the end of uh, in the early January, they, they, they bring down the Ukrainian airplane the killing over 160 uh, passengers they denied they eventually when they saw the document they, they accepted you know they had to do it. so but they said what intentional that also made the people so angry you know the come the street but what changed things which i, I want to also uh, talk about it the, the spread of covid 19 uh, so little bit that halt that process of the people you know i am sure uh, because uh, just, just imagine, you know, in November, the people, you know, that much force come to the street. In January, you know, they, you know, they, they burn the banners of the Qasem Soleimani across the Iran. They low participation by all standards in parliamentary election, which is took place on February 21st and, uh, this year. But all those this is predicted it will be very hot summer for, you know, for, for regime in Iran. But the spread of the COVID-19, which by many standards, directly, indirectly, the regime has a hand in that. In early, early March and late February, the activists, you know, they, they showed the, the video and the footage of the, the people being, you know, infected by virus. The regime try, denied. The uh, regime's uh, Mahan airline, which is belong to IFGC, continued to travel to China and further back while rest of the world closed their airports to, to the Chinese, uh, you know, flight, the regime was working in the Middle East and picking up in the Chinese and break, taking back to China. So Iran actually become a second place beside China, you know, to, to spreading virus in the region and the uh, and the world. Let's be remembered in early late February, the first people come to Canada, they traveled from Iran, they affected by COVID-19. From the U.S., I remember the first cases in New York. Also, a couple were from Iran to the Persian Gulf, to the across region. So, Iran, if, if one day, if one day international community want to have a hearing about who spread the virus, Iran should be also held accountable, but maybe, but alongside China. So, uh, this is the situation in Iran. Iran is denying to this, uh, the how many people been infected, how many but dead. But what we have a, 
uh, data and information by late late April, the people being killed for the virus is, is past 36,000 and infected people over a million. Just imagine, it's more than one month, half ago. And unfortunately, as a result of reckless policy of the regime, Iranian regime, uh, beside Iran in recent, uh, uh, recent days and weeks, uh, Iranian Kurdistan being affected by a virus. And we have uh, inadequate hospitals. There is no equipment. The, the, the nurses, the doctors suffer uh, enormously about uh, the regime not paying attention. Uh, we saw in the, in the march, while doctors uh, without borders, you know, they came to Iran, they offered to help to create some, some temporary hospitals. But in the few days, they, you know, they told them to, they deported them from Iran. They're asking for money, you know, they, uh, when the frequently the United States and other, other Western power you know, try, you know, offer to help the Iranian government, you know, they, what they need in money, they, they spend uh, by many accounts recently been published over $16 million to their terrorist activity across the Middle East, but they're asking for $5 million, you know, loan uh, from World Bank. So this is a situation we're going through so we we predicted you know the situation is at the catastrophic level you know and for the covid-19 and the people very very upset and very very angry about this i'm sure the iranian regime you know in days and weeks to come it will have a very tough time thank you thank you mr bayezidi i appreciate your remarks we'll come back to, to you during the q and a um, mr balnur please yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, this uh, great meeting. Um, most of the uh, opinion and points that are actually made by my colleagues is acceptable by me also. And uh, I just don't want to repeat it, uh, those words, but uh, I would say have no doubt about Iranian government, what they do in the Middle East and also in Iran. What they do, it's been their uh, active policy since the establishment of the regime. So uh, if I wanna just put it in few words, I could probably say that uh, execution, suppression, imprisonment, uh, extortion, and on top of that, disinformation uh, to pursue world to a different direction and picture Iran uh, like something else is not existed. It's the uh, policy of regime. Uh, more than 100,000 people are executed in Iran since the establishment of the government. And then I could uh, uh, say uh, more than 18% of these executions are happened in Kurdistan and they were Kurds. If I wanna speak about the reality of Kurdistan today, what is going on, it's beyond our, anybody's imaginations. Uh, economically, politically, we are uh, in a very harsh conditions. Uh, our people suffering uh, in one side uh, because of the, uh, uh, what, uh, those uh, embargoes and then uh, other policies by the world and Iran. At the same time, Iranian government does the same thing to his own people, which is Kurds in Russia, Lat Kurdistan. So therefore we have a very dire situation. Uh, economically, they suffering a lot. Uh, there is a, a issue in Kurdistan, it's called Korbar, for example. This Korbar, uh, I have some uh, statistics that says, uh, last year, only last year, 79 people died just to make a few dollars a day. 176 people, got injured, same thing. And then these guys who they injured, they cannot even go back to work. So these guys are carrying about 100 to 150 pounds of goods on their shoulders and they're crossing waters to make a few dollars. And then uh, there was some reports saying that the only reason the Iranian government does that to these Kurdish people in, in our region, just because 95.5% of the goods smuggled to Iran, it comes from the official borders. Now, there is only 4.5% uh, 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 goods coming from these areas which Kurds live between the border of Iran and Iraq and Iran and Turkey and actually carries by the Kurds. 
So that's why these guys, they want to make sure 100% of these goods smuggled to Iran, it actually controls by the mafia of the regime. So they don't want to have any Kurds benefited from this, uh, 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 these points. And now, if I want to uh, uh, say something else about uh, what's going on, real, what's the reality of in Kurdistan today, I'd like to go ahead and give you some examples of how many people have been executed. Uh, in the entire Iran, 2019, 690 people executed. So between them, 280 people were Kurds. So if I uh, want to give you an, uh, 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 a percentage of how many Kurds have been executed, it, uh, while we are like 10 to 14 percent of, uh, we are 10 to 14 percent of the population, but we lost about uh, more than 45 percent uh, through these executions. So what they do, regime systematically killing, execution, imprisonments, uh, they try to control this area inside Iran and outside, as Kagarash emphasized, what's going on in the outside of the border, you can see that just today, uh, it's been reported that there was uh, a lot of uh, heavy guns and uh, personals actually deployed to the uh, border to probably control the uh, movement or have some pressure and the KRG probably and uh, there might be something else and then uh, this is what's going on outside. So I, I just want to at the end say that inside and outside Iranian government, it's a regime that uh, it's, uh, uh, its acts and the way they act, it's beyond anybody's imagination. But at the same time, they're trying to put a better picture of themselves to the world. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you, Mr. Baral Noor. Uh, Professor Phillips? I want to react to some of the comments that you've made. Uh, firstly, and most importantly, I want to express solidarity with the remarks that Kak Kamran has provided. We join you in deploring the execution, the torture, the disappearances by the regime of Iranian Kurds. Uh, these criminal activities have to stop and those responsible should be held accountable. Uh, Arash, you mentioned the Cooperation Center. Uh, it's a very positive development that the four parties are working together, that there's a structural mechanism for exchanging information and fostering cooperation. And we welcome additional information about the Cooperation Center and how it can function with Columbia University as our discussions about political transition progress. Uh, Katsali, you and others talked about federalism, and I would just want to underscore an important point. Um, federalism is not necessarily a uniform approach to power sharing. Uh, there are elaborate mechanisms called asymmetric federalism, where different regions and provinces are given differing degrees of local control over their politics, their economy, and their culture. It's for that reason that we feel the dialogue between Iranian Kurdish parties is important. But also, we recognize the importance of involving other Iranian minorities, because each view may have a different perspective on the degree to which federalism would decentralize and devolve powers. So the project that we have embarked on with you uh, needs a partner. The four parties have been our partner. We, didn't, we need an institutional counterpart and the cooperation center uh, is invited by Columbia to work with our team of experts as we explore federal arrangements and asymmetric federalism. Because ultimately we need to have a new constitution, a new system for the rule of law. And as Kak Kamran has made clear, accountability for the current crimes uh, and transparency about recent aggressions, including troop movements by the IRGC towards Iranian Kurdistan uh, today and as we speak. So I look forward to continuing our discussion. You can count on Colombia as your partner 
as we define the modalities of communication and the technicalities of federal power sharing. Thank you, Professor Phillips. Uh, we have um, quite, uh, actually more than eight questions so far, but um, before I open mic, the mic for a few attendees, uh, there's one question that is kind of brief, that's what we look forward to, um, is about why the Iranian Kurdish parties do not unite their fighting force uh, under one umbrella. And that's a question maybe uh, for the panel. Mr. Arash, you can start with it. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Basically, uh, we are currently doing that. Uh, this umbrella organization, the Cooperation Center, uh, is working on that. And there have been some discussions in uh, the Cooperation Center. Uh, we're trying to actually make it possible, make it easier for Peshmerga forces, the headquarters of Peshmerga forces to actually cooperate with each, with each other and coordinate their force and missions inside uh, Iranian Kurdistan. So basically uh, it is, I believe, a step-by-step -step endeavor and we are going to actually reach that goal, I hope. Uh, Professor Phillips, would you like to comment on that? Yes, it's important that uh, the cooperation center uh, develop practical forms of cooperation. But we also have to recognize that the Kurds in Iran are under constant pressure. And even as we speak, you know, there are aggressive acts that are foreseen against the people. So one of the functions of the Cooperation Center can be to monitor and report to the international community crimes that are being committed uh, Columbia University has an excellent communications program. And if there are reports that are prepared by the Cooperation Center, you know, we're ready to work with each of the parties to help disseminate and publicize the facts so that the truth can be known around the world. Thank you, Professor Phillips. We will we'll open the mic. The next set of questions, maybe Mr. Baizidi and Mr. Kamran can uh, take. We'll open the mic for Ambassador uh, Peter Galberth. Here we go. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank you all for this uh, excellent panel. Uh, and I'd particularly like to uh, say a, a word about my friend, David Phillips, uh, whose involvement with this uh, cause uh, goes back uh, at least to 1990 in the Congressional Human Rights Foundation and trying to Make, help make Washington more aware of these issues. Uh, I, uh, and I've, you know, I, I followed the Iranian Kurdish uh, question. Uh, uh, in fact, in 92, I was up in Kandil in April with Sadiq Sarafkandi. We had a wonderful discussion and dinner, and just a few months later, he was murdered in the Mykonos restaurant in uh, Berlin. So this is, this is certainly a long history. But my question is, uh, are there any Iranian opposition groups, and I don't mean from ethnic minorities, but shall we say from the Persian community or predominantly Persian, with whom you uh, can cooperate or who are supportive of your agenda? You know, I think of the, um, the darling of uh, the right wing in Washington, which is the Mujahideen-i Kalk, but I remember in 1991, because I was in Iraq during the uprising, they were the ones who uh, uh, supported Saddam and actually helped put down the uprising and helped the Iraqis retake uh, Suleimania, killing hundreds of Kurds. Uh, so they obviously are not credible. Is there anybody, any group that might be credible as a partner, um, again, not among minorities, but among mainstream, or not mainstream, but from the uh, Persian, the, the largest ethnic community in Iran, namely the, the Persians? Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Mr. Baizidi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Galbraith. Um, for the question, I think, yeah, we, we as a Kurdish Iran, Kurdish political party, besides creating Center for Cooperation of Iranian Kurdish Party, we have tried to, uh, to go for three level, you know, unity among the Iranian Kurds, 
and then because Iran is a is a multi-ethnic country, you know, many people call it the last remaining empire in the modern world. Uh, so we, since 2005, you know, we have worked the uh, organization under like, uh, the Congress of Nationalities for Federal Iran, which is I think the this include the Kurds, Kurdish political parties, Azeris, Baluch, you know, Turkmen, other group, which is good, you know, to show how. And then recently ha has been some uh, some you know some uh, primary steps to uh, beside Kurdish unity you know cross ethnic groups be include uh, Iranian Kurdish par Persian parties which is unfortunately they are very fragmented you know uh, mostly the elites you know or some of them they not believe even a limited right to Kurds like federalism or for sharing power you know so but one of the organization I can call it called uh, recently last year it was published the solidarity for freedom and equality in Iran. This is also the working, but I believe we as achieve, we cannot 10 to 12 million Kurds, you know, cannot bring down this regime, cannot we do change, you know. So we have to need to go to, to try uh, to create uh, cross ethnic, you know, included the Persian party. So, but this should be understanding each other, you know, try to have a dialogue, you know, how the future, if. if future if Iran be look like. So I think it's very important and those steps already been started. Thank you, Mr. Bayezidi. Uh, Mr. Balnur, would you like also to comment? Well, uh, as Kak Salah uh, said that uh, it's not easy to actually uh, create an environment to have everybody on one table and then uh, talked about one goal. Um, unfortunately, the current regime just like the uh, ex regime of Shah, uh, they are uh, their their common goal to suppress Kurds and denying their rights. Uh, uh, they are they have the same uh, goals and they have a uh, same common ideas. And uh, also, it's not easy uh, work with the other factions uh, like such a Mujahideen or probably monarchists in Iran. Unfortunately, they are so tied to their uh, uh, ideas that there is a unified Iran, and they think that kind of uh, situation that we have right now, it's a threat to separate Iran, uh, which we uh, strongly believe that this is not a threat. The, what we try to do, we try to actually create an environment to live in and be equal with the uh, uh, other uh, 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 minorities, or especially Persians. So that, therefore, we deny that always, but. Um, so far, it's not acceptable by them. Also, uh, 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 what the program uh, by Dr. Flip right now, I think this is, could be another light uh, for everyone to gather uh, around this uh, federalism idea. And then we can have this idea spread these words between other minorities once we, um, all the minorities uh, actually having the same idea, this kind of federalism is good for Iran. I think Persians, they have, uh, 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 I think they have no choice to actually cooperate with this idea. And then also strongly, I believe that a, a, the next Iran probably uh, would actually choose their uh, goals and futures by referendum, which also this idea of federalism can be actually taught between all these minorities and we can get prepared for it. Thank you, Mr. Balnur. I will open the mic for Julia Anderson. Julia, the mic is yours, if you have a question. Um, hi, yes, thank you, can you hear me? Okay, so I wanted to say thank you for everybody. Um, your ideas and thoughts were really interesting. Um, I have a question, because I understand that most of the Iranian Kurdish parties are, I mean, fundamentally exiled in Iraq, and correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, just a couple days ago, I read that, the, that Turkey and Iran have been coordinating attacks in the KRJ, going against, of course, international law and serenity calling it as a sort of self-defense against Kurdish parties. Um, now, many of you said that the, I mean, of course, the international community isn't reaching out that much. And I mean, also the United, yeah, European Union is um, closing a blind eye. And as well, NATO, I mean, is uh, leaving much of its uh, bases, as well as the United States from Iraq and Syria. So my question is, um, what future prospects do you see, like, in terms of the negotiation um, with, I mean, the European Union, Iraq, other neighboring countries, uh, and, uh, I mean, the United States, for example, for the Iranian Kurds? Uh? Thank you, Julia. Uh, Mr. Arash, could you take that question, please? 
Of course, thank you very much. So basically, uh, no, we're not uh, basically mainly based in exile. The main part of our organization is inside Iranian Kurdistan, which is a clandestine, which is the clandestine part of organization. Only the leadership and the Peshmerga forces, the leadership is, uh, is uh, outside, it is in Europe and in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, and the Peshmerga forces is on the borders. And the main part of our parties uh, and our organization, at least I can uh, speak uh, about uh, PDKI, is actually inside Iranian Kurdistan in a form of the clandestine part of the organization. Uh, well, in terms of uh, negotiations, well, look, I mean, uh, it is imperative that United States, Iraq, and Europeans understand this fact that Iran is using us as a subject of, you know, uh, experiment. They have repeatedly done that in, in the past. They actually attacked us with missile, uh, uh, with missiles. They attacked uh, our bases. They attacked our, the basically, Iranian Kurdish dissident camps in Iraqi Kurdistan. And the world basically remained silent. And that encouraged them to uh, repeat that in Saudi Arabia, in the case of Saudi Arabia, they encouraged them to repeat it in Iraq again and to actually uh, further stretch their muscles there. So that's why I believe uh, it's, it's, it's basically beyond the question that it is imperative for the United States, especially, to see the reality there and step up and basically do something about it there. Uh, we are trying to uh, convey the message uh, but I'm not sure how much they are serious in this. Professor Phillips, with your experience, uh, how could the Iranian Kurds approach, and as Julia asked, to negotiate with the United States, with the European Union, and the, with the international community? When you reach out to, to U.S. policymakers and the international community, we all know that there is strength in numbers. A unified position and a coherent political plan will bring people on board. You also have made it very clear in your remarks that you're not recommending the breakup of Iran, but rather the democratization of Iran. So having a unified position, putting forward political plans and emphasizing political transition that would transform Iran in its entirety from a religious autocracy into a pluralist democracy are important points to make. You can do that through your oral interventions. It would also be important for the Cooperation Center to adopt a statement that makes all those points crystal clear. And if you, in your capacity as party representatives, want to work on such a statement, we'd be pleased to provide some legal and editorial assistance to your efforts. Thank you for that. Um, let's take, we have a lot of questions, but I could tell our attendees that if we couldn't take all of it, we have more than a dozen of questions. I will make sure that your question will be directed to the panel and they will get your response via email in case if your question is not um, addressed here. Uh, Philip, feel free to ask your question. Uh, hi guys, thank you so much for giving this wonderful talk. I just have a very simple question. Um, given Biden's support for Kurdish political aspirations in the past, particularly in Iraq, uh, what hope do you have that Biden will take the Iranian Kurdish issue more seriously? Um, and what would you like to see out of a Biden presidency in regards to Iranian Kurdish policy? Thank you, Philip from FTT. Uh, Mr. Bayezidi, could you comment on that? Yes, uh, I think in my opinion, the, the Kurds for this matter of the US election, they should, they should remain bipartisan, you know, uh, how, because I, we know how during election the candidates, you know, they say, uh, you know, they say a lot of things, but when the policy, you know, as Dr. Phillips said, you know, partially is uh, you know, related to us, you know, our unity, you know, dedication to the, the plan, a coherent plan, which is produced. And, and uh, uh, 
I, I, I don't know. Mo mostly it depends how, how situation is go because uh, one, what we saw, maybe some policy, the current administration, uh, we, we saw as a positive step, like, uh, you know, uh, designating IRGC as a terrorist organization, putting maximum pressure on Iran, you know, not necessarily because we agree mostly with that, that much level embargo, Iran is good, but there is no other alternative. The other alternative do nothing. So uh, I leave this policy to, to, to the next administration, how to look, uh, and we don't know how the world, the post-COVID, if, if there is post-COVID world, you know, how does it look like, you know, we already see the dictators around the world, you know, they're trying to score what they couldn't do in the previous, you know, China doing to the Hong Kong and maybe Taiwan and so other other authoritarian dictators around the world. So I think my opinion, we should wait, you know, this dust down the, the election, you know, which they choose, you know, we choose next, you know, administration, you know, the, but see how the world look like, but mostly I said is also dependent on us, how Iranian could, you know, be united and they asking something as Dr. Phillips, you know, said, we are asking for democratic federal Iran. So this is logic and this is, you know, can be done. Mr. Balnur, uh, what would you say? Well, uh, I think uh, Mr. Biden was part of the administration when actually JCPO uh, took place. Uh, and then uh, we actually connected with uh, most of these officials in the administration of uh, uh, when Mr. Obama was president. And I, we emphasize these points that while you guys go in and uh, uh, negotiating this deal, there should be some kind of other negotiation besides such as human rights and uh, even the uh, uh, constitution of Islamic regime right now actually uh, conveys some uh, points that could be acceptable by us, such as, uh, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Article, uh, I think, 14, which is really great for us. Um, he can go ahead and uh, say something like that in the public, that if this is, uh, uh, this is he can do for us, at least uh, based on actions, we can see that, and then we already supported these actions before. So I think uh, it would be a good idea. We want to see what he want to say about the future of Iran. We just want to say that in public, once we saw that, we, 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 we are going to support it, obviously. Thank you. Professor Phillips, not to uh, change the main topic here to domestic politics of the United States, but what would you say about uh, Mr. Senator Biden's or Vice President Biden's approach to Iran, if he wins? So two important points. Uh, of course, we all recall uh, Senator Biden's editorial with Leslie Gelb on power sharing in Iraq. Many of the principles that were described in that article are applicable to Iran. So I would study that editorial and extract from it specific language that uh, was used for Iraq, which is applicable to Iran. Uh, I'd also like to share that the uh, platform committee is drafting language for the Democratic Party on potential hotspots that a Biden administration will have to address. And Iran is surely on that list. Uh, it would be important to submit some language to the drafting committee that specifically addresses your concerns as Iranian Kurds. And I'd be pleased to work with you on that language and to help you submit it to the right authorities. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Phillips. Maybe we'll have time for another question. Uh, so there's a question about your efforts, the party's representatives in Washington. Uh, what are their daily, weekly efforts to raise awareness of this issue, of the Iranian Kurdistan issue in Washington? Mr. Arash? Well, basically, uh, we're trying to approach the administration, uh, Congress, so civil society uh, papers here to raise the awareness about the Iranian Kurdish issue and uh, the, the, the political situation in Iran uh, to have an effect, to have uh, basically attention of 
the society and the government here in the United States. We're, we're doing so by basically contacting uh, people here. Uh, but uh, can I actually answer one or two questions that I saw in the, uh, in the questions? Because uh, one or two of them, I believe, were addressed to me. The first, the first one was why Israel is important. Well, because of two main reasons. In the case of Iran, uh, it is a criteria that measures tolerance, that measures the level of supremacism and expansionism in the uh, dominant discourse of the political groups. So it is very important to see that tall. It is very important for us to see as a, a, a future in Iran that tolerance is the main base of it. Uh, that does not follow supremacism and expansionism outside. And the other reason is because we believe that uh, the, 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 the main, basically, uh, the main power that prevented a viable peace in the, re uh, in the region was Islamic Republic of Iran and has been Iran. So a kind of viable peace uh, for the region uh, basically will lead to a better uh, life here in the United States also in, uh, in the rest of the world. So that's why I believe that the case of Israel uh, has both merits for us as Kurds in Iran and merits for Western uh, people. And also uh, the other question about uh, why Iranian Kurds uh, do not uh, basically uh, feel that they belong to Iran. Uh, despite the fact that their language is uh, their language is close to Persian, well, I would say why Swedish and uh, Norwegian people do not uh, feel that they belong to each other while their languages are so close. Here, the the problem is uh, uh, recognition. You know, look at the history of Iran. The history uh, when you look look at it, Iran has been shaped in a form that uh, has its its structure actually has uh, excluded us and has denied us uh, uh, from our basic rights. That's the main reason that basically uh, our identity has been shaped in a form that uh, we believe that we are in, in, in danger and uh, only a mechanism based on uh, self-rule and uh, based on federalism and uh, a deep democracy in Iran can save us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we end this session, I would like for our guests to have a brief remark, uh, a closing remarks, and then the Professor Philip will have his uh, own remarks. So, Mr. Balnur. Well, uh, thank you for inviting us. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Philip for his uh, great comments and his cooperation with Kurds. I think this is an honor to work with you, and then I hope one day we create an environment that uh, uh, all Kurds are free and uh, living in a federalism. Thank you, Mr. Baizidi. Would you like? Yes. Uh, so, thank. I would like thank you for organizing Washington Kurdistan too, and again for Dr. Phillips, you know, participation and remarks, you know, and his offer to continue with us uh, as the Iranian Kurdish Party to, uh, you know, to make our proposal to the to the international community and the United States. We hopefully, uh, we are also, we acknowledge that we are living at, through a turbulence time. You know, we don't know how the world is going to be look like in a couple of months, but we hope for the best for free, democratic, and federal Iran. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Saleh, closing remarks? Thank you very much. Thanks, WKI. Thank you, Columbia University. My message uh, will be, it is important for United States to realize that it is in their direct interest to support us Kurds in Iran. It will be in the direct uh, benefit of uh, region to support us in Iran. It will be in the direct uh, benefit of peace if they support us uh, Kurds in Iran. And basically, it is very important to realize that uh, Iranian Kurds can actually repeat the same experience as Iraqi Kurds and Syrian Kurds and provide an example of democracy and tolerance in their region for the rest of Iran. Thank you. Uh, I would like to recognize uh, a good uh, group of uh, think tankers in these uh, 
in this event. I much appreciate uh, them being here, including from Middle East Institute, including from the FTT, and some professors from different universities. Uh, I would also just want to repeat that those questions that we were not able to answer, I will forward them to the representatives and to this panel, and I will. I, I could promise you that uh, they will get back to you with some answer because we were uh, we didn't have much time basically to take them all. Uh, Professor Phillips. Gentlemen, thank you for your excellent presentations and thank you to you, Yusuf, for ABLE moderating and WKI for its leadership in this issue. Imagine a pebble that is tossed into a pond. Uh, agreement among the Kurds on federal arrangements would be the first concentric circle. The second circle would broaden the agreement to include other ethnic minorities. We're stronger together and with community. And the third circle involves Persian progressives with whom we can have a dialogue and potentially collaborate. It's only by building coalitions that we're gonna be able to achieve our objectives. Uh, the US government should more strongly support your efforts. With WKI, Columbia is prepared to convene briefings on Capitol Hill. Certainly people like Peter Galbraith and others can advise this process. I just want you all to know, and I wanna send a message to the Kurds of Iran that we stand in solidarity with your efforts. It's a noble cause, it's a just cause, and working together and cooperating, we can realize the goals that we share. So this is a journey over the course of the coming uh, months, we'll continue our dialogue. We already have a small circle of participants uh, planned for later this week. Uh, you're not alone, we stand together and we stand with the Kurds of Iran. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Phillips, for being here. It was truly an honor to have you with us, really. And we appreciate everything you have done in the past and continue to do so. Thanks once again for the speakers, for the great guests we have. And at this point, we will end the session. Thanks again.